All right, you can turn over to 1 Timothy. We'll be continuing our series in 1 Timothy. We come to an important section in Timothy because here in chapter 3, Paul sets forth to Timothy the qualifications for elders. As we have seen in our time that we've spent in Timothy, that uh, Paul wrote to Timothy to encourage him to deal with problems that had arisen at the church, the churches, I should say, really, in Ephesus. Okay, that some of the churches had elders that needed to be removed. And that would mean that new elders would have to be chosen. Timothy was a young man. This was a difficult task, as we've seen, that he was given to do and how Paul encouraged him to look to the Lord and to do this task faithfully. Still at this point, the work we're doing here at Glenholm is a preaching station, and so we hope that one day it will become a mission church where we'll, Lord willing, be choosing our first elders in the days to come. So this passage really points to that whole idea Um, Some of these churches where Timothy was ministering, you see, would have elders removed, and then they would have to get new elders to replace them. I want to also look at Titus 1, where Paul speaks to Titus about leading the church and choosing their first elders. In Timothy, it's more like replacing elders that are already there. There's a little bit of difference, too, as a result of that. Whereas in Titus, it's bringing the first elders to the fore. So um, they're mostly the same, but there are some notable differences that I want to point out to you that um, we need to understand. Whether we're, we are an established church that is choosing elders, or as we are here, a church that uh, is a potential church, a mission uh, right now, just a preaching station looking to one day choose elders, and Lord willing. So listen now as I read to you first from 1 Timothy 3 and then from Titus 1. Here is God's word from 1 Timothy 3, beginning in verse 1. I'll read to verse 7. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. And then here is, here is God's word from Titus, Titus chapter 1, and I'll begin in verse 5 and read to verse 11. Paul again writing this time to Titus says, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things that they ought not, for the sake of dishonest gain. And there we end the reading of God's word. May he add his blessing to that reading. I want to point out to you from the outset that there are some important differences in these two passages. First of all, there is the difference in the reasons that these lists are given. And I've already kind of touched on that a little bit. The church at Crete, where Titus was, was a mission work. Many of the churches there had no elders at this point. 
And so, therefore, Titus' job was to ordain elders in every city. Paul gave him a list of qualifications to guide him and the church in choosing those elders. The church at Ephesus, on the other hand, was fully established. Paul had left Timothy there to deal with false teachers that had gained a foothold in some of the churches there and to deal with some of the problems that they had caused. When you have elders that are not sound, then it's going to cause all kinds of problems. This can be seen in 1 Timothy 1.3, where Paul writes, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Timothy had the tough job at Ephesus, a very tough job at Ephesus. He had to deal with men who were already serving as elders, but who had become disqualified by their poor doctrine and practice. He's given a list of qualifications to guide him in determining who is no longer qualified, partly. In chapter 4, Paul reminds him, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared as with an iron, forbidding to marry, and so on. So he's saying there, there will be false elders that will, will show themselves to be false in the, in the church in, in the days to come. Don't we see that today? We see people that, elders in the church and ministers that don't even believe the Bible. They don't even believe the Bible is the word of God, and they make up their own beliefs. And they don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. They don't believe, you know, many, many different things like that. It's important to realize here that both kinds of work that are in view with Titus 1 and, and uh, 1 Timothy 3 are necessary. While the work of bringing in new leaders is always the most pleasant, the work of removing elders that have proven to be unworthy is essential to the health and welfare of the church and must not be neglected. There is no such thing as tenure in the Christian church and we aren't just to wait for men to die off if they have gone astray. We should not be ashamed to remove elders when it is necessary. In 1 Timothy 5.24 it says, some men's sins are clearly evident preceding them to judgment. In other words, you see them from the outset. But those of some men follow after. God has not called us to read hearts. We can't do that. Just because a man becomes disqualified later on doesn't mean that we erred in ordaining him in the first place. If he met the qualifications that God has given for us in Scripture, for office in Scripture, it was right for us to ordain him, and he may even have served well. We might think about even Judas who went around with the disciples and as far as we know he did uh, even the healings and preachings and all the things that went on but he was uh, an apostate. If the day comes then that this a man no longer meets the qualifications then the, er then the error comes when we don't act to remove him. I saw a report about a survey that was done recently just to illustrate what I'm talking about in which it was found that only 22% of Presbyterians affirm that people do not earn their way to heaven by good works. That's so contrary to historic Presbyterian doctrine. Of course, we're talking about the liberal churches you have like in the U.S. where I grew up, the, the, uh, and there's ones here like the United Church where so many don't believe. We, we don't allow that, of course, in our church for someone to minister that doesn't believe <laughs> salvation, that thinks that salvation is by works. But this is, this is rampant. 22, only 22% affirm that people do not earn their way to heaven by good works. The percentages were even smaller among Lutherans, Episcopalians, and Methodists. But how do you think this happened? How did it come about, that situation come about? It happened because elders were allowed in the churches who denied the basic teachings of the faith. Just like Hymenaeus and Alexander that Paul spoke about. But unlike that situation, they were not removed from serving as elders, and so their doctrine spread like cancer, as Paul warned. Even Paul himself was not ashamed 
to deliver these men over to Satan that they might learn not to blaspheme. Men that he himself had probably trained and ordained. That's what I mean by he wasn't ashamed. He had trained them. He had overseen their ordination and everything, laid hands on them. And yet he was, he was willing to remove them. The Holy Spirit expects us to do the same. So we see that the first difference in Timothy and Titus has to do with the fact that Timothy was dealing with an established church and Titus was dealing with a mission church. The second difference that I want to point out is related to the first. You'll notice that in Timothy, qualifications for deacons are included. But in Titus, there is no mention of deacons at all. The reason is because the need for deacons had not yet arisen in churches in, in the churches in Crete. They didn't even have elders yet. The first order of business was to ordain elders. In Titus 1.5, Paul speaks of the appointment of elders as a thing that was lacking at Crete. There was something that the church wasn't yet established because it had not been done. He says to Titus, for this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city. These words suggest that if there are no elders in the church, then the church is not yet established. This same thing is seen in Acts 14, where it is recorded that Paul and Barnabas returned to the cities where they had preached the gospel and where groups of people had come out and, and believed and they began to establish new congregations, what did they do when they returned? What was their business in returning to visit those places again? It was to establish elders in every church. Acts 14.23 tells us that. Until this was done, you could not say that the church was yet planted. A church is not established until it has its own elders. Elders are essential for a church. But deacons are not necessary until later. One reason for this is because the office of elder includes the office of deacon, or it contains in it the office of deacon. So it is a principle of Scripture that the greater offices include the lesser offices. For example, the office of prophet includes the office of a teaching elder, the office of a ruling elder, and the office of deacon. Those are all contained, and you could add evangelist if you wanted to as well. That's why you have Peter referring to himself as an elder when he writes, and why he is seen doing the work of a deacon and distributing the church, office, the church offerings to the needs of the saints in the early chapters of Acts. But then later on, when they become overwhelmed, Deacons are called and appointed and ordained to take on that role. But initially, Peter the Apostle and other apostles were involved in doing that. So in the same way, the office of elder includes the office of deacon, so that an elder is an elder and a deacon at the same time. In other words, an elder can always do anything that a deacon would do, but a deacon can't do anything that, everything that an elder would do. Now, what we see at Crete, no deacons, is what we also see at Jerusalem then in the early days. At first, the apostles and teachers at Jerusalem are caring for the widows in the church. They're the ones who oversaw the distribution. But as the church grows, the task is too big. So what did they do? We'll listen to what it says in Acts 6, 1 through 4. Now, in those days... When the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. Now, uh, so these were the ones that were the, the uh, Greek ones, the Greek speaking ones, and the, the Hebrews. And there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. <clears throat> Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. 
So the church at Ephesus, where Timothy was, was different than the church at Crete because the church at Ephesus had been established for some time. Paul had labored for several years, if you remember, when he was at Ephesus, and the work had flourished there. It is not surprising then to find deacons were needed there to help carry the load so that elders could devote themselves to the ministry of the word and prayer. In time, deacons would be appointed at Crete as well. But at the writing of Paul's letter to Titus, the concern was to establish elders first, so deacons are not mentioned. Easy to see how this principle applies to a mission church, isn't it? We look for elders first, then deacons. The third difference between Paul's letter to Timothy and his letter to Titus about the qualifications of officers has to do, interestingly, with the prohibition of novices to the office of elder. And I think this is a very important principle here. In 1 Timothy 3, 6, we have the words for the, in the qualifications, not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. The word translated novice here literally means a newly planted one. It was used to refer to actual plants, you know, like an olive tree or something like that. That was a novice plant. It was one that had just been planted. But here Paul uses it figuratively to refer to a new convert. The reason given in 3.6 is easily understood. A new convert, he says, should not become an elder because of the danger of pride. Now here was the great church at Ephesus. It had been planted by the Apostle Paul. It was known, you know, among the, the churches, and it was a church that was an example to many other churches. Here was a venerable company of elders that Paul had been taught by Paul himself. He had discipled them, and these men were serving in the church, you see. Is this a place for a new convert to enter into the role of elder? No, it would not be appropriate because there's men that have been seasoned, that are established, that are able to serve that way. There would be a great danger that such a man would become proud. He is not coming to help out in a struggling new work that can barely keep itself alive. He is coming into a well-established, flourishing work. But this prohibition of a novice cannot be found in the list given to Titus, and for good reason. Crete was a mission church. If novices did not serve at Crete, there would be no elders at Crete. The danger is not in elder novices among novices, but in elder novices among the mature. So there is a sense of a relative thing going on here. Learn from this, that there is a need in the work of the church for flexibility in the church of Jesus Christ. Not everything is always applicable to every situation. When Paul planted mission churches, he did not wait for years before he appointed elders in those churches. Novices were used in those early days. Often elders were ordained within the space of even months in that kind of a situation. Of course, they did not often have some, they did often have some that were Jews that had been elders in the synagogue and had even were waiting for the Messiah to come. And when it was announced that he had come, they came over and they were men that were already seasoned and mature. But some of the churches where Paul labored, like at Philippi, they did not have that. And many of the churches in the Greek world did not have that. And it appears at Crete, that they're not men that were already there that were, were seasoned. So that qualification is not included. The fourth difference between Paul's letter to Timothy and his letter to Titus about the qualifications of officers has to do with Paul's emphasis on teaching. In Timothy, he simply says that they need to be apt to teach. But in Titus, he says much more, verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. 
Why is there so little emphasis on the important, this important qualification in 1 Timothy 3? You would think that if anything, there would be more emphasis because of the problem that they're having with false teachers that had affected the church there. How can this de-emphasis be explained? Well, rather than explain it, I would prefer to deny it. True enough, the actual list in 1 Timothy 3 has little to say. But chapter 3 is not the only chapter in Paul's letter to Timothy. We always need to look at the whole picture and the context. The reason Paul does not say all that he said in Titus in 1 Timothy 3 about sound teaching is because he's already spoken thoroughly to that matter. In fact, the whole emphasis of this entire letter is on the need to uphold sound teaching. So he's talking about it all the way through. Just look again at his opening words in 1 Timothy 1.3. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from a sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, and so on. We conclude then that the need for elders to be sound in teaching is just as great in Timothy as it is in Titus. But we don't narrow ourselves when we look for qualifications of, of elders just to the list that are given there. We look at the overall context. When he says apt to teach, it's a loaded statement in Timothy that includes all that he has already spoken about that. So you can see then that the lists in Timothy and Titus are not exactly the same. You need to learn to apply God's word to a whole variety of circumstances as Paul does here. There are other differences here too, even in the way that Paul chooses to present his material. For example, in Titus, he emphasized that an elder is a steward, but in Timothy, he emphasis, his emphasis is that he does a good work. And it is to this that we now turn secondly. You need to see that the office of bishop is a good work. Okay, looking at our text now, focusing more on Timothy. This is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. Paul tells us that this is a faithful or reliable saying. He is quoting a secular proverb, one that was often quoted by Plato. It was commonly understood in the Greco-Roman world that if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. So wait a minute, I thought that was a, a church office. No, it's not. The word bishop simply means overseer. So it speaks of someone actually who visits, who visits a situation or visits people. It's episkopoi is the verb in the original. And it, it, in a sense of coming to inspect them or supply what is needed. He has authority who is the overseer or the bishop has authority to come and deal with situations that are brought before him. The word was used to refer to everything from governors who oversee a province to even midwives that oversee the birth of a child. They were considered bishops. So if you, if you have a midwife helping you in birth, you can call her bishop so-and-so. See what she thinks about that. And the proverb is, if anyone desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. Being an overseer, and of course he is talking about an overseer in the church in this case, is a fine work to do. In 1 Timothy 3.1, Paul is simply applying the proverb to bishops in the church. A bishop, you need to understand, is the same thing as an elder in the Bible. This is brought out clearly in Titus. So we're going to look over at Titus again for a minute. There, Paul uses the terms interchangeably. In verse 5, he tells Titus that he left him in Crete, we read it before, to do what? Appoint elders in every city, 
And then he talks about the qualifications in verse 7, speaking of the qualifications of elders that Titus was to appoint, still talking about the same people. He says, for a bishop must be blameless. So basically you can say he's appointing elders as bishops or overseers in the church. A bishop is another name for an elder. An episcopoi or, or episcopos is uh, the same for presbyteroi or pres, presbyteros. So in 1 Timothy 3.1, Paul is saying, I want you to know that serving as an elder in the church is a fine thing to do. It's a good work. Some of the false teachers had made it look like a wicked work. Selfish men made leadership of any kind, or selfish men make leadership of any kind, look like a bad work that no good man would ever want to do. Sadly, this was the case at Ephesus, wasn't it? So there, therefore, he says in Timothy, it's, it's meant to be a good work. <laughs> it's a good work that you do, because it, it looked like it was a bad work from what was going on there. The false teachers and their wicked ways are described in 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 5 with these words. If any man teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of truth, who, suppre- who suppose that godliness is a means of gain." In other words, they just want to enrich themselves by serving as an overseer. Paul, therefore, reminds Timothy that serving as a bishop in the church is supposed to be a good work. It's a good work that he is setting out to do. Now, I want you to consider how this is so. How is it a good work? First of all, serving as a bishop is a good work because it is not just a position. It is a work. He doesn't say it's a good position. He says it's a good work. How this office is misrepresented by those who look at it is little more than an honorary position. One of the things that greatly contributed to the decline of the church prior to the Reformation was the fact that men began to look for the position rather than to do the duty. Like the Pharisees in Jesus' day, They like to go around with important sounding titles, wearing important looking garb and doing all kinds of important looking things and sitting in important places and all of this sort of thing. They like to show up for special ceremonies and receive honor from men as they perform fancy religious rituals that God had never even appointed. They look silly with their paper hats on, you know, when you think about it, like what are these hats? Who appointed you to wear that hat? walking around gilded altars with with smoking incense, you know, waving it around. Who told you to do that? Uh, Bells and unintelligible, mumbling words that are unintelligible to people. What they didn't do was the actual work of oversight. And that's a grave problem. They did not attend to people's needs in the church of Jesus Christ. And this happens in any church where elders stop caring for the people. They're just playing elder. They see being a bishop as a good position rather than a good work. It's like the man that wants to be a soldier. You know, I'm I'm gonna join the army. But he doesn't want to fight. (laughs) And when it comes time to go to war, like, oh, I I didn't want to go, I didn't want to go fight. I I was just wanting to be in in the army. You know, he wants the position, but he has no interest in the work when the war begins. That's very common, isn't it? The office of bishop is not said to be a good position then, but a good work. An elder who is really doing the work of ministry will agonize over people's problems in the congregation as he searches God's word for solutions and as he labors in prayer for their souls. He will cry when God's word is not respected and loved and when Christ is despised and rejected. He will spend hours laboring in the word to bring the word to the people. He will face enemies who will despise him and who will use all manner of craft and deception to try to attack him and discourage him. He will do combat with Satan 
and with the world as he stands guard over the church, fighting enemies from within and without the congregation. He will face situations that end in disaster. He will plant churches that go completely astray. Paul had to deal with that with different churches that he planted. He will have people who ask how they can be saved and, then, and, and who then turn and walk away when they're called to repentance. He will train up Judases who will turn around and betray him. Serving as an elder is a good work. It is a hard work. Jesus told his disciples that they would be rewarded on account of the hardness of the work and so told them that they should not lose heart because you will receive a great reward, he said. The Lord is pleased with such work when it is done for him. But of course, not all hard work is good work, is it? Some thieves work very hard, don't they? Especially when they don't um, break any of man's laws. You know that kind of thief, the kind that don't break any of man's laws? They use the system and work it around to, to get other people's possessions in their pocket. And they do it all legally. They work very hard and use a lot of arts and crafts and things to, to make that happen. But they don't do a good work. So a hard work is not the same thing as a good work. But a good work, in this case, is a hard work. The work of a bishop is a good work also because it is such a useful and important work. The bishop is called to shepherd the church of God that God purchased with his own blood. That's how Paul described it to the presbytery at Ephesus some years before when he visited there. There is no work on earth that is greater than this work. Think about it. The church that God purchased with his own blood. The glory of God the Father and of Jesus Christ is inseparably tied together with what he does with his church. The bishop seeks to bring men and women and the church as a corporate body into sweet union with King Jesus so that members will adore King Jesus, follow him, become like him, and so that they all, everything they do savors of him. The bishop is responsible for looking after the church as a physician, as a steward who distributes food to her, as a manager who sees that everyone fulfills his or her calling, as a guard who fights and protects from enemy attacks that arise from within and without. All of this for the most important institution in the world. A man thinks he does a great work when he gives oversight to some great corporation, like uh, Microsoft or something like that. But this does not compare with looking after the church of Jesus Christ, which he purchased with his own blood. It is indeed a very high calling, but that very fact is utterly misunderstood if it makes a, mind, a man high-minded. When he realizes that he is appointed by Jesus Christ, as verse 5 says so well, take, to take care of the church of God, he ought to cry out, who is sufficient for these things? It ought to humble him. It ought to humble a man and make him look to God for help. He must recognize he is doing a work that is absolutely impossible for any man to pull off without God's help. He cannot possibly take God's truth and cause anyone to receive it into their hearts. You can't do that. That's the work that only God can do. There is no way for him to bring gospel life to a dead man and make him live. It is a work that God must do. Every day he is laboring to accomplish things that are totally beyond his ability, completely beyond his ability, trusting in God to do that. And if he forgets that and he thinks somehow that he is able to bring life, then he's sunk, he's, he's ruined. And because this is such an important and excellent work, so moving on, it is also a work to which men ought to aspire. Bringing this down to our situations in Halifax and here, we have a problem in our church in Halifax that there is a lack of men who care about God's kingdom and about the church of Jesus Christ. Many of them ought to be elders now, but they're content to remain in the shadows. 
they, they do not rise up to take responsibility in their homes to lead their wives and their children in godliness. And so we have men that have not matured and developed because they're not taking the work of God seriously enough. Sometimes we even have to poke them about attending church. Some of the men in our, our congregation don't even attend regularly church or giving tithes or things of that nature. The kingdom of God has little importance in their eyes. Just what we were talking about earlier in, um, in uh, Haggai, that, uh, yeah, they're concerned working on their own house, but the church, eh, whatever, you know, maybe, whatever. The world has had a bad effect on our men. It tells them that their natural drive for sex, for taking dominion, for conquering, for pushing, for victory, are all evil things. They're not evil things, they're God-given things. They're taught this from their childhood. And so that causes especially young men that have grown up in our current environment to channel their energies as knights of video games because you don't hurt anyone when you play a video game. And a man that doesn't go out and labor for the kingdom of God and for bringing the gospel and this sort of thing, yeah, he, he can channel all those energies into a video game. Like, what is that? What is that going to do? Or in sports, maybe. Or even worse, in porn. Or in destructive behaviors. He can be a great hero as in, his, in his pornography with these women that he, he dreams about. Or he, he becomes like Absalom a man of rebellion and defiance who, who uses those, those masculine traits and tendencies that men have in all the wrong ways. No, these things are to be channeled toward the kingdom of God, toward establishing and building up the church of Jesus Christ. Instead of striving to be strong husbands and fathers and leaders in the church and in society, men today settle for conquering little fantasy worlds and fantasy women. The worst thing of all is that they do not advance the kingdom of God by establishing and leading a wife and children, helping to establish and lead godly churches, and in taking dominion and service through their daily work. Their God-given masculine strength is not used for God's kingdom, and they become either listless or empty or rebellious and destructive. Gentlemen, we're talking here about the kingdom of God. We're talking about the calling of our holy God who destroys those who bury their talent and do not invest in his work. I have had to repent because in my ministry, I do not believe that I have emphasized the holiness of our God in the way that I should. Our forefathers knew what it was to tremble before God. They knew that he was not to be trifled with. You don't just blow God off and go and do something else other than serving him. His work is not a work to simply walk away from. The work of an elder is a fine work. There is a desperate need for men to see the importance of this work and not to dink around. The excuses need to stop and men need to strive to live holy lives that they may aspire to serve in the church of God. There will be no church if there are no elders. Next time, we'll look at the qualifications for this office, and we'll see that there are basically qualifications, or there are qualifications for basic godly living. That's what they are. They're not some kind of, you gotta have super traits, super abilities. It's basic godly living every day. We need to pray that men will rise up and take to take responsibilities of serving in the church of God. Please stand and let's pray. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you, O Lord, greatly challenged by what is in your word, where we see that indeed it is a good work for a man to desire the office of bishop. It's not something that is supposed to be thought unimportant, and that a man channels his energies in building his house, or even worse, in building video games and, and fantasy worlds and his pornography sites or whatever he's doing. Father, these things are reprehensible, and we know, O oh Lord, that, that you have called us to something that is far better, 
something that is far more important. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us, that we would turn from our folly, and that like it says in Haggai, that we would not devote ourselves to other things that are not building your house. We know that it's, we are to devote ourselves to establishing our families and homes and things like that, but not to the neglect of the establishment of the church of Jesus Christ. And Father, there's so many that are not even working to establish godly homes that are just idle and not thinking about your kingdom and about what you have called us to. So Lord, we come to you and we ask you to have mercy upon us, O Lord. We pray that you would forgive us for Jesus' sake. He has come and he has died for our sins. And we pray, O Lord, that like happened in Haggai, that when the prophet spoke, that there was repentance, there was change. We pray that it would be so, Lord, and that we would see men rise up that will be able to serve in your church. We're almost to the place where we have no elders in, in Halifax. And we pray, Lord, that you would have mercy upon us, O Lord, and that you would bring forth those that would be able to serve there and then we would also have much better ministry here as well. So, Father, we bring this before you. We ask you, Lord, to show us where we need to change, how we can change, what we must do. We pray, Lord, for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Receive his blessing now. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.